And let's <laughs> switch over to the second presentation, which is uh, on a completely different topic um, from. Not really. Uh, not really? <laughs> not really. Okay. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm curious it's about the story. Strongly related. So let's welcome um, Tassilo. He's a student at TU Dresden and also a guest research student in Berkeley and uh, a part of his interest in uh, routing security, which I guess is, is the reason why you're involved in um, the uh, Internet Exchange Point in, in Dresden. Um, you're also interested in um, uh, languages for time-sensitive distributed networks, and that's what you're going to talk about today. And I'm curious to see how this is connected to time synchronization. Yeah, so my name is Hasselo Tanneberger. I'm, as said, a student in Dresden and also affiliated with UC Berkeley. So the, the routing security stuff is things I did with Matthias together, but this work is um, under um, Geronimo Castrion, the compiler construction chair in Dresden. And this relates quite heavily to the um, time synchronization um, the, the talk we prepared previously but also to concurrency and parallelism uh, in general. And I basically want to explain to you uh, how good timing information can lead to a very nice execution model that is potentially interesting for Riot. But let's start with something a bit more trivial, a garage. Um, but we want to build a, a bit more smart garage. So we have a, a motor which pulls up the garage. We have a lock. We have a remote to open the garage. And now we want to write firmware for it. And um, there are very easy mistakes um, to, uh, to do if you build embedded systems, and that's you have concurrent accesses of this, for example, shared data structure or, or garage door. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong now. Um, so first thing, yeah, okay, there's a, clearly a race condition on that thing, uh, on that shared data structure. So we we potentially uh, get preempted uh, in some very unlucky moment which leads to an invalid state. Um, but we also have potentially unsafe ordering. So in our garage example, we want to first um, unlock the door and then pull it up. If you don't do it in the correct order, you know, your door breaks. Um, so we fixed the first problem, the invalid state. We slap a mutex on there. We have now mutual exclusion. Those um, the access to that data structure gets sequentialized. Um, okay, so we solved the first problem, but now there's the second problem. And the second problem is the order problem. And here we have to 99% of the time it goes perfectly fine. We first unlock and then we activate the motor. But in those, in a very small percentage, it goes the other way and that breaks. And that's very bad. This is non-deterministic behavior. Um, very, it makes it incredibly hard to debug because, for example, imagine you test this system in your CI, your CI runs perfectly, run fine, uh, but if you then deploy it in the real world after a couple of months, it will suddenly uh, spontaneously break. So that's very undesired, and it's very, uh, you know, a very, very sneaky problem. So let's fix that. And this is, you see it gets more and more complicated. So we have, I don't know, now some event queue where we push in lock and motor events, and then we have our process function, um, which then works through the events previously. And even this implementation is not perfectly fine yet. Imagine calling process at the wrong point. Um, you know, imagine calling lock, then process, then motor, uh, or motor, process, lock. It also goes off the rails. So you can see those OS synchronization mechanisms that we get from different operating systems, um, they don't really solve that problem. Um, and this is the topic of the talk. How do we um, maybe find paradigms um, that can actually solve, solve this problem? So I already fear mongered a bit about uh, implications and problems. I will continue that in a second. Then I will present one solution um, called Linga Franka, and at the end I will um, show us some ongoing work to uh, um, make Linga Franca available on Riot OS. So, I know, I know in this community, uh, MQT, uh, MQTT is not the preferred solution. You like co-op, um, but many IoT systems use MQTT, for example, to distribute their sensor values, um, and MQTT doesn't make any guarantees about ordering. You push in, uh, you announce your topic A and B, um, at, the end, uh, at the other end, you get a uh, different order, uh, completely different order, and normally those MQTT libraries, you just give them a function point to call when, some, uh, when you get some message. You know, the, those the two functions get 
potentially get called wrongly or in a not intended order. Um, and this is very prevalent. We heard yesterday the talk about auto so, uh, about this. You wouldn't hack a car. Um, and there are already, already auto solvers mentioned. Auto solver also suffers very greatly uh, from this. And there's a lot of extra um, um, code in place to potentially at the, at the moments, uh, at the points where it matters to uh, check for such problems. Um, and it's very tedious and very error prone as we maybe already seen in the small code snippets. And to drive this, whole, uh, this point really home, aircraft doors. You want a particular order. You first want to disarm the door and then open it. Then it opens regularly. If you do it the wrong way around, your emergency slides deploy and that's the, basically the view of the catastrophe from outside, from the airport perspective. Um, very costly, very expensive, very annoying. Um, so what are the problems? What, what kind of problems do we want to solve? Um, and the first one is timing. We, if we get two events in watch order, when do they count as simultaneous? When do they count as one, one comes before the other? Um, so we, we want to have some sense of time. We want to have deterministic execution. I think that's rather obvious. But we also want a reactive system. If you press your door key on your garage, it shouldn't open three minutes later. You want to open it, that it opens now. Um, and it also should be scalable. This, the solution I presented at the beginning is not particularly scalable. You have still, for example, one shared mutex that can lead to congestion. Not good. Um, so let's look at potential solutions that are out there already. First one, actors. Um, classical example, for example, CAF from Thomas Schmidt, uh, or ACA, that's a Java thing, um, where you have uh, those class-like things that have a state, um, internal state, and they can pass around messages. And um, for example, this example here with those three different actors, already are non, uh, is non-deterministic. You have a relay where you pass your message to the other receiving actor at the other end, has no idea in, you know, which message was sent originally, in which order. Not good. So it, but it's a scalable system. You can different actors. They can be independent from each other. It scales, and it's also reactive. You can introduce priority systems into it, so, it, so it's fast. Um, but ordering, unsolved. Second option, synchronous languages. Um, maybe some of you know things like Estrel or uh, Lustre or Signal. Um, they were from INRIA, I think, originally. Um, they, Estrel, at least, for example, is an imperative language for very control-heavy applications. And, um, so you have timing semantics in this language. Um, you, have, um, you also have a deterministic execution. Um, and you also have, it's also reactive because you have, um, you have preemption in um, uh, Estrella at least. Um, but it's not really scalable. Those, those things don't particularly scale up. Um, so we want something. So, and now we want to take a look at, um, for example, how hardware people do it. It's very similar to those uh, synchronous languages. Um, and they work under a couple of assumptions. So if you do Verilog or VHDL hardware synthesis, um, they have three main assumptions, and that are computation happen instantaneous. So your transistor is basically, uh, it switches the state uh, instantaneously. Um, the transmission of signals is also instantaneous, so you don't expect, the, uh, I don't know, that the wire takes some time away from the traversal. And you have logical ticks. So in, inside one logical ticks, all of those events happen. Um, and that already brings us uh, a bit closer to our, our goal here, um, where the door basically receives those two messages um, by this semantics instantaneously. They, they basically can treat this separately. They see, aha, I got a motor message now, singly, or I got a log message, or I got them both, or nothing. Um, so you can react on those four different uh, potential um, occurrences. Um, and this is, this is basically the whole chart of those uh, four domains I opened up. Um, so at the, the initial example I showed is threads. It's not timed, it's not scalable, uh, it's not particularly reactive, and it's not deterministic. Uh, I showed actors, they're scalable, but not the other properties, and I showed also uh, synchronous languages. But we are interested in what, in this little black question mark there, 
And this little blank question mark is uh, a recent development. It's, I think, together. So UC Berkeley, TU Dresden, and many others um, are actively working on it. It's called Linga Franca. And if you visit the website, it basically states Linga Franca is a polyglot declarative coordination language for real time concurrent and distributed systems. So there's, there's a lot to unpack to. Um, so first of all, what, what do we mean with polyglot? What's, okay, declarative is somewhat clear. And then what do we mean with coordination? Um, and those, those three faces you see there are basically the initial people behind it, Martin Lostro, uh, postdoc from Berkeley, Edward Lee, uh, and my supervisor, Christian. Um, and now let's talk a bit about this language. Um, so this is the basic component. It's a, it's a reactor. Reactors are like, conceptually like actors, they hold state. Um, but instead of actions, we have reactions. Um, and these reactions are ordered. And we have this, pre so we have this precedence relationship um, between reactions. And inside those reactions, those little dark gray arrows, you put your target code. And target code can be C, Python, Rust, TypeScript. Um, and that's where you put your business logic. Um, and those then get called at the correct time. Um, and everything around us is basically the, the Linga Franca coordination semantics. And you have ports. Ports are to uh, um, send values between reactors. Um, and very importantly, Linga Franca is uh, a, uh, uh, a paradigm that has logical execution time. So you have a logical timeline at which events happen. Um, and this is composed of a tick, like hardware synthesis, and then micro steps in, in, in a tick to logically order events that happen conceptually simultaneously. Um, and that's how, for example, how we could um, expand this to our garage example. So we have our garage door at the right, um, we have two buttons at the left, and then we have um, this controller that controls it all. And there are different uh, language features you can see here, for example, Linga Franca has support for timers. So if you want to trigger events um, periodically, in this case, every 30 seconds, um, you have logical actions to schedule events into the future. You can say this, in this case, reaction three should be triggered um, in, so reaction two can say, I want to trigger reaction three via this logical action in two hours. So and. Here it's very clear, so I want to explain now a bit how, how this deterministic execution comes about. Um, and the idea is every color in the following plots is every, uh, every reactions that have the same color are, uh, can be executed in parallel and everything, um, different colors are basically sequentialized. And button one, and so that those two buttons, they, are, they don't share any state, so they can be executed in parallel, then we need to uh, uh, execute that reaction because it's the, it has potentially an input um, and then we can move on to the next, this, and then we can execute those two also in parallel because they're in different reactors. So we can, we can go through the program and calculate those levels, those colors, put, we call them internally level, levels, and we do this calculation at compile time or at some, in some runtime implementations. We do that at startup and then we have this. We then at le every logical tech we go through every level and potentially execute those reactions when they are, when they, for example, have an input value on their connected port. Um, and that's how, we, that's how we enforce determinism because everything is linearly ordered. Um, and so what I want to make sure is that this, did you understand that this is potential, that this is, should be seen as a specification. We, we describe a timing specification here that reaction five should be triggered every 30 seconds. That's a declarative statement how this topology should be look like. And occasionally, uh, your actual program will deviate from that, um, from that specification. And there are different also language features to capture that. For example, deadlines where you can say like, if my logical time lags behind physical time for some duration of time, so if my program executes slower than the specification tells, we can react to that with this, for example, deadline reaction here. Or the Linga Franca way of 
introducing non-determinism into your system, so a fully deterministic program is completely useless. We want to have somewhat of user input occasionally, we want to, to react to some things from, uh, from the real world, and those, um, at those points we use physical action. Those are the explicit marker in the language to say, here this event can happen spontaneously at some point in time, and then we need to react to it. Um, and this, this, um, the, the way this, um, what we do here is we take the timestamp of, oh, we, we got a value here, then we take the timestamp of that and then we put it onto um, our timing queue. And that's why it's also very important for us to have very precise uh, wall clock time as we use it, because we need to, to we need to, want, we want to have precise timestamps so we can put it at the correct place in the time queue. And if this is completely off, then we will insert it at the cor uh, incorrect place and then it will, it won't behave correctly. Um, so that's why timing is also, or good, good timing information is critically important to us. So, okay, you're right at people, you're potentially saying, okay, cool, I could maybe program, I could describe, I could uh, write concurrent programs with it um, for write OS and we, uh, uh, in the spring at one of the Hacker Neck events, um, a colleague from E. Erlang from uh, Norwegian University of Technology, we started um, working um, on bringing Lingua Franca to Riot. Um, and what we did is we started, um, we realized rather quickly that the old runtime for normal C programs on, um, on your desktop PCs or normal standard C programs on POSIX is maybe not the best, so we started with a new runtime and we packaged this new runtime as one of those Riot packages that uh, your concept of libraries. Um, and what we do is you, this, this, this code you see here um, is actually Linga Franca code and all the diagrams you see beforehand were uh, diagram generated from that code. So we have a diagram generator which takes this code as input and then can generate diagrams out of it and that more or less as in VS code extension so it's also real time so you can also click on different components in the diagram and then jump actually to the code uh, where it's located. Um, and this is, this is, you see it's a somewhat of a strange mixture of um, C and Linga Franca code. Um, this curly bracket equal sign means there's now target code following uh, this is basically that's saying here, now here comes target code. And so it's a, it's a combination of this LF coordination code plus your um, business logic code. And that gets fed into the Lingua Franca compiler which is, it's, a, it's more of a code generator that generates then the particular target code and that gets fed together with the reactor micro C into your actually very nice right build system. Um, and then we get a binary blob which, you can, which we can flash. Um, the runtime right now is not fully 100% feature complete, but it will get there. And maybe, maybe a small outlook on what we want to do in the future um, is Linga Franca has semantics for federated execution. So this logical time can be distributed. If we basically can distribute this logical time um, where we are currently in this execution, we can start distributing this over multiple hosts. Um, and what's potentially very interesting to us is doing, for example, this execution of our low bandwidth radio protocols like LoRaWAN, and like Bluetooth Flow Energy um, with, the, with, the, with the thought that we want to build large applications with, that we do with the specification and then we roll them out to different platforms. So we have, we say, we have our Python um, um, cloud inst, uh, or so part of the program is a Python server on some cloud and then part of the, uh, part of this program is, I don't know, our Riot embedded device and then there's other Riot embedded devices and they should communicate between each other. And right now there's only support for like standard TCP IP, but it's maybe potentially very valuable to also have in the field uh, more of those low uh, bandwidth radio protocols. And the other thing that's potentially very interesting is uh, edge detection. So the physical actions, um, they should really be uh, timestamped precisely. So for example, this was work from uh, Stephen Edwards, which uh, he builds the Estrel uh, Columbia compiler. Um, and they, for example, were able to, with, with Estrel, were able to um, timestamp events to 60.2 nanoseconds precise with, and what they used, they, were, they used a standard, uh, a standard RP2040 um, and these RP2040s have this POI on it 
this programmable IO, uh, IO which has like it accepts like 23 assembly instructions and they were able with the 23 assembly instructions to detect very precisely those um those incoming flanks um and then we want to of course basically upstream that from the from the hardware to the linga franca program to execute then this the downstream reactions that are behind this physical action so for example imagine a button you have a button you press it the flank goes higher the operating system detects it streams it up to the linga franca program and it will do its thing um and if this is very interesting to you so it's conclusions order matters really much. It's very safety critical. Um, Non-determinism is a big struggle and potential. I, I, would, I would guess that a lot of programs behave very non-deterministically and there are definitely problems in them that just didn't surface yet. So um, just imagine how many threads you have. Like Rust does, for example, for example does compile checks for um, um, to ensure mutual exclusion, but for example, this ordering is not is something that Rust didn't solve. And for example, Linga Franca, in this sense, solves this ordering problem by forcefully sequentializing things. Um, and then Riot OS is coming. Uh, Linga Franca support for Riot OS is coming very soon. And if you want to join, there's so tomorrow is Saturday, and on Saturday there's the Riot Hackathon, and um, yeah. Myself and Lasse will um, do some hacking on it, and with that, I want to say thank you. Yeah, thanks for the talk, and um, let's go up for questions. Um, thanks for the presentation. I was on the way after work. Um, a question: When you specify your system in, in, in this language, would it also do an analysis? Uh, because like typically, just because you write something and you come up with something doesn't even mean that it's uh, like workable. Or does it only, whatever you put in there, you, it produces code? So there's, for example, one, one thing that we do um, as a comp so at compiler level, we, we validate a program you give us. And for example, one check we need to do is for causality loops. So imagine, for example, um, that this garage door feeds back to the garage controller and but then on a higher level so it should it triggers a reaction that should be logically before that and that you cannot do because in order to execute that reaction you first need to execute the, the lower ones so this output port gets fed um, and just for example is a causality loop and we cannot have those causality loops in order to have a, this, this execution scheme so we basically, for example, at compile time, check for these kinds of loops. Okay, so for example, if I would like to, de to, to make a deadlock detection, I would phrase that as a causality sort of dependency, is that correct? Or somehow? Where, where do you want to detect your deadlocks? Um, it, like, this is probably too simplistic to actually have deadlocks, but, uh, but imagine, like you mentioned Loravan at the end of the talk, mm. and like you have message exchanges, things happen, and then uh, you may have uh, the two parties may get out of sync, uh, which I would call a deadlock because then the communication probably can't continue any anymore. Uh, would you be able to detect this, uh, for example, during compile time? So that those two different components basically wait for each other. Right. Or at least they either wait for each other or they get out of sync and then can't, um, like, you have a, typically, uh, you have a, in, in systems, um, which talk to each other, like the Loravan case, mm -hmm. you have uh, state machines running in, in these different yeah. nodes. Yeah. And if suddenly you get out of sync in the terms of state, then you can't proceed anymore. So that would be, that would be a deadlock, you know, like some messages got lost. Uh, or if you would implement your Loravan stack in Lunga Franca. Yeah. Um, Is, would that so be detected? Conceptual, so if they would basically, uh, but this would be a runtime feature. So we have this runtime that executes um, the program. So you, so your idea is, so your conceptual idea is that in this runtime we do basically checks if, if there's, for example, the program is not uh, progressing. So I would have to. So you are, you are saying like, okay, there's no. So because there are languages that exist that that, that mm. where you can. Um, perform all sorts of checks which 
they don't produce code uh, to finally run it on IoT devices, but they allow you during the design of the system to detect problems, like the problems you mentioned before. Yep. Um, uh, in, your, in your case, your emphasis is, is more on uh, the code generation part and not so much on the analysis part. Is that, is that a, a fair statement? We want to, yeah, so I, yeah, we do not, we don't do analysis of basically the code you put in. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we check that uh, the, you put in a valid Lingua Franca program. What you do in user space, if you deadlock in user space, okay. not our problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, could, you, could have, you could extend it in a future version that it actually does the analysis and that produces code that would be totally. kind of nice. You, uh, you can, you can, there, there was, for example, ongoing work on the, for example, the Rust target, there's from France, for example, uh, different, different proof checkers on Rust, and so we did also try to do, for example, proofs of the, of the user space code, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, proving, yeah, proving but imperative code is uh, very hard. Yeah, what was mentioned with the proofs, I think that's more uh, security proofs, which of course are also important, but uh, I think the type of checks you want are more um, liveness checks, uh, that typically we can, race like conditions, these type of things? Uh, race conditions are not there anymore. So if you program, if you put your Lingua, if you model, you put your code into a, inside the Lingua Franca program, there is not a race condition. Everything will be, a, if you access one data structure, it will, this execution will be sequ sequentialized by the order you give, you define in this program. Mm -hmm. So here, if you, that what those numbers means that basically here, yeah, this garage controller reaction one executes before two, three, and four. And at, at every logical tick, this ordering will be uh, if 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 button for, uh, for, uh, if the first button is pressed, then reaction one will execute. And mm -hmm. but I think that's only in this simplistic example. I think you wouldn't be able to guarantee this uh, in in sort of like the Outlook Loravan case because. There, here you have one state machine only, so for example, I can't press both buttons at the same time and then both events happen. Um, but in the, in the LoRaWAN case with communication protocols, you can't, you can only control yourself, you can't sort of you control the other side, right? No, the, the idea is that you basically sketch both sides from one program. You have the specification for both sides mm -hmm. and then you co-generate um, basically two separate programs that you run on the two, those two different hosts. Okay. So you make it basically from one piece and then you distribute your pieces. Mm -hmm. So we can, re because then we have the whole program, we can reason about the whole thing. And that's what I meant, for example, with those cloud IoT deployments. The idea is that we make this higher, we make this large, you make this large specification of how your entire system should look like, and then you compile out those different pieces. So write, I don't know, write, mm -hmm. uh, write code or something like that. Little board, and then you have I mean, your Python thing. And because we have the whole thing, we basically uh, we can do the, all the compile checks for you. Is that already available, or um, is that the, the outlook? The full polyglotness is not available yet. Okay. So uh, having, for example, Python backends and then IoT, that's not not yet there. But that's basically where we want to get to. Yes, thank you for the presentation. It looked really nice. Um, one of the requirements, if I remember correctly, was like reactiveness of the system. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correct, but um, how does Lingua Franca guarantee this, or is it more like and it doesn't prevent? Um, you, can, you can start losing registrations here. That's the point. So you can, for example, say, I. Uh, so the idea is um, that you can start losing restraints in the specification. So, you, for example, you could say, um, I, uh, there's, for example, different connections. You, have, you see these different connections, as well, for example, physical connections, where um, also, where you, for example, don't wait for the other side. Um, so you can, the language allows you to basically loosen the constraints at points where you need them. Meaning that's the, that that's you don't the, have to, the idea. You, you don't have to wait on a slow process where you don't necessarily yeah. need to. If resolve. you, for example, ah, say yeah. like, then then you have model this in this fashion. Yeah. Thank you. So that's 
maybe one of the more interesting works, do you, you know the cap theorem, constraint availability and uh, partitioning? Um, it's something from originally from the 2000s from databases, but we, for example, accepted it to the Cal theorem, um, where we basically, so this consistency availability uh, partitioning thing basically means you cannot have consistency um, and availability at the same time. Um, but what you can do with Linga Franca is you basically have a, you can pull and push it along on the, basically you have a slide. You can say like, I want, this much availability and this much consistency on this slide. And basically what you prioritize more you will get. Nice. Okay, any other questions, comments? If not, then let's thank Tassilo again.